How ought we to respect the wishes of deceased loved ones? Hello, and welcome back to The Gray Zone. My name is Juliet. Today, we are joined by Amalia and Gray, and we will be discussing a case from the High School Ethics Bowl Nationals case set, number 11, The Wishes of the Dead, which deals extensively with the ethics of interpreting people's wills or wishes um, after their death. Do you all want to jump right in? Uh, Yeah. I'll give a brief summary of what the case is about. It's about two women who are married and one of them is taken ill very tragically. She's going to die. There's no way around it. They've been together for a very, very long time. And she is sad about this and has a couple of uh, three wishes that she you wants. You should name, name them. Okay. Yvonne is the dying one and Zaina is the living one. <laughs> and Yvonne has three wishes for Zaina. Uh, she, she's got this whole thing when she's on her deathbed. She believes that her death is related to caffeine ingestion for some reason. There's not really support for this, but she is very, very upset about it and requests of Zaina that she never drink coffee again which is a big request no no coffee specifically that's the difference between maybe caffeine it's it's a gray gray zone next she wants her money to go to research into caffeine uh causing disease uh instead of going to Zena, and she asks that Zena never remarry after her death because she believes that would violate the sanctity of their relationship and Zena is sort of okay with this at first, but as she goes on and lives her life, she um, starts to feel that maybe she doesn't have to stick with these so far because caffeine is not proven to have links to causing terminal illness, and she's found a new partner who she really wants to get married to. So should she still have to follow Yvonne's wishes uh, out of respect for the dead or out of respect for her partner, and why? And so we have really three main problems here. We have the the ask of Zena to choose not to take to ingest caffeine or coffee in the future because of her her deceased partner's wishes. Then we have the the aspect of the money and the funding that has been solely devoted to researching this issue of caffeine being related to terminal illness, uh, which is a, a different set of ethical issues. It it prompts us to think about. And then thirdly, uh, we have the ask that Zaina never remarry, which is uh, another infringement on, or uh, this could be interpreted as another infringement on Zaina's personal autonomy, but it's a very different issue uh, than asking Zaina to never have another relationship or to never get involved romantically with another individual ever again. And so we're having to weigh many different issues uh, at the same time when looking at this case. And so we have to almost compartmentalize the three parts, the three asks of Yvonne's will uh, in order to really get into the like the quick of what we're actually going to be discussing. Do we want to start by, by breaking down which requests we believe that it would be permissible for uh, Zena to break or which that she ought to respect? Do we want to kind of make a distinction or share our initial thoughts on that issue? Yeah. And maybe not to be be so dogmatic as to say you can always break this wish or always follow this wish, but maybe to look at the specific circumstances uh, in this particular case and to try to look at like specifically because this is about caffeine and it's after a 10 year period where a lot of time has passed uh, and the world has changed, you know, just not to be so stuck in these these uh, universal almost principles. So would you say that the caffeine request is the one that is the most is the most moral to violate out of the three. I mean, it seems the the least extreme to me. I don't know. I mean, I'm a little impartial. I was joking with the other two members on this podcast that before we sat down to record, I actually made myself a cup of coffee. So I'm I am a little bit partial to caffeine, but I think in this case, out of the three, the three requests we're looking at, whether or not someone has a cup of coffee on a regular basis seems less disrespectful than whether someone decides to marry, right? Because that would be a, a complete life change that would alter the course of, of their future. It's, it's a tough one I, because I think there's an emotional attachment to that and that um, Yvonne genuinely believed that that made her sick and led to her demise. And she wants to 
I, I assume she would be wanting to protect Zena through this request um, rather than try to limit liberty of any kind or, or uphold her memory. It, w- it seems like it's more altruistic in terms of doing something for Zena. As a symbolic request, maybe this one would be worth following just because it was so meaningful to the other person. Like you can look back at it and say that it's kind of a silly thing to ask someone to do when it's demonstrably false that caffeine causes life-threatening illness. But even so, just out of the meaningfulness it had for that individual, you might want to follow along with it. Like people can request all kinds of, of according to us, silly things to happen after their death. Like you can ask that people make a pilgrimage to a certain site every year. People might want to follow uh, the request of the dead out of like symbolism rather than what it actually means. Like people could ask for all kinds of symbolic stuff that doesn't actually mean anything, but means something to them. You know, like I'm trying to think of an example. Like, well, uh, it's like the aspect of care here is more important than, than like maybe the realities of like scientific research into terminal illness because uh, as it says the the funding that was gone going towards the research has proven that there isn't a definitive link between the caffeine ingestion and terminal illness but it's like the care and the love that was put into that request to try to save uh, her which what, what she believed would be her spouse's life is maybe more meaningful you know than just the the apparent silliness of requesting that someone not drink coffee I'm thinking about like things that parents request their kids do that might seem like silly or annoying at times, like um, uh, curfews, for example. Like those are kind of arbitrary, but they're there for a good intention most of the time. It's like the concept of beneficence. It's trying to do good for other people. Yeah, exactly. And I think. It- it's admirable. I think it's really interesting how the request is only not to drink coffee because there's caffeine in many things. There's caffeine in tea and chocolate and a whole bunch of other foods that are very common. And so it's interesting to me that the request was only to not drink coffee uh, instead of maybe to not take in any caffeine at all. So if uh, if Zaina really needs caffeine, then she she has a lot of options. <laughs> Uh, even if coffee is the, her most preferable, it, she can still get caffeine in other ways. So I don't think that it would be too much to not drink coffee. I'm not a coffee drinker, so maybe I'm biased. But um, it doesn't seem too much to me to not drink coffee when there are other options available. Well, and, and what's interesting, too, is like my initial idea when I was looking at this was as long as the, the person making these requests is it violating the liberty of those that they're making the request upon to such an extent that, you know, it, it inhibits them from living in a, in a healthy way, right. Or their yeah. pursuit of well being, then, you know, maybe the request is fine, but it's interesting because it's like, then where do you draw that line? But I, I but I, again, I would go back to the point where coffee is really not an essential thing to seek well being in life, or it doesn't limit your liberty to, to pursue you know, being the best person you can for yourself and other people. And and it carries so much emotional weight and its meaning yeah. with her, in, in her prior relationship that it almost seems like it would be appropriate for her to respect this wish, right? Like, and this is, it's interesting because this conversation has changed my original opinion, which was, of course, if she wants the coffee, you know, she's waited, she's been respectful, she's done the research. But now I'm thinking about what it actually means to the two of them in a relationship rather than looking at it from my perspective. I'm realizing that that does carry a lot of weight and it's not limiting Zaina's um, ability to live in a, a, a feel fulfilled way. I like that. I mean, eh, sort of. I really don't know where I stand on this right now. Do we, does anybody have anything else to say in terms of the, the caffeine or do we want to talk about the research or the marriage? I think the research is where the caffeine aspect gets really interesting because uh, then you have so like in Zena not drinking coffee, it's really only boils down to Zena's wealth, uh, health and wellness, uh, and her well being and Yvonne's wishes for her. But then you get to the funding, and it says it's a it's a large sum of money that is only being devoted to researching caffeine. And while it is true that caffeine can have some negative health impacts, it's not linked to any chronic disease or terminal diseases. 
and the money is legally protected, so it can't be used for any other source that could perhaps do more good in the world than just uh, more research into proving that caffeine is not the cause of these chronic diseases. So then you you broaden the scope to whether the impact could have more of an impact by researching something that does have a definitive link to chronic illness or chronic disease, uh, and that would potentially save more people's lives. And I think this is where it gets more complicated for me, and I'm still not at a solid place where I feel like I can make a decision yet. And it's it's interesting, too, because the case never specifies, at least to my knowledge, what Zana wanted to use the money for. But does it change the ethicality of where that money is if Zana wants access to that money to to fund her current life or if she wants access to that money to donate it to further research or another organization that could help people? I think it would be, I mean, if she was going to use it for something that wasn't caffeine-related illness research, giving it to a place that was studying what the actual disease she had was and trying to make it better in that sense, because like that might do, or it would do, it's not a might, caffeine doesn't cause uh, terminal illness. I think that research would be a lot better suited. It just, it doesn't make sense to have money going to a place that's useless if it could go to somewhere that's useful, you know? I also think it depends on whether Zaina has the resources to live on her own, uh, you know, to live and to to maintain a quality of life that uh, allows her to try to achieve her full potential and to have her basic needs met. Uh, And so if she's currently in a place where she's financially struggling, then I think it would be permissible for her to use some of those funds if it were allowable um, to try to support her own life. But beyond that, I think, Amalia, what you said was a really great idea of trying to put that money towards researching what actually caused her her spouse um, to pass. And so, and, and then, then presumably that would have far-reaching impacts and supporting other people who may have suffering from the same thing. Um, so I think it's like finding a balance. I'd agree. Absolutely. Like if she was in a place where she wasn't financially sound, like if she was um, struggling to pay a medical fee or something, like if her wife were alive, if Yvonne were alive, she would want to support her. She would want to pay those fees and make sure she was taken care of. So I think taking care of immediate need and using the money to do very uh, demonstrable good and try and prevent a worse quality of life is a totally is a totally great way to use that money even if it's not what she wanted explicitly it's like that idea do what you think do what you think she would want like is the whole interpreting thing interpret and say yeah like follow the spirit the the spirit of the will or of her wishes not the letter per se uh, because then it would now be applicable to new life circumstances. So if you're acting in good faith, and then the adaptation to her wishes could be justified in trying to adapt to to the evolution of the world um, that Yvonne wouldn't have been able to predict. Yeah, don't use it for something frivolous, but like send it to where it would do the most good and send it to something that would have been meaningful to Yvonne. I think, the, I think the interpretation piece is so key. Like that's really what all of this comes down to is, is being able to understand the, the person and their, I guess, both their wishes, but also their relationship you had with them when, when they were alive to be able to, to, to determine what is the best course of action in the present. Because so much changes from year to year that requires the reanalysis of, of the requests. Should we talk about the marriage aspect of the uh, the will, the final aspect next? Because I sure. think that, that sounds like a really good um, way of being respectful to the wishes of the dead while not being so dogmatic that we can't compromise. Yeah. Like, we can assume that um, Yvonne would have wanted the best for her spouse after she died. But it's also, like, I think it's important to, uh, I think a marriage is a lot of a bigger deal than a chunk of money. The relationship that you had is more significant and it's more meaningful. And I can understand wanting to keep that between the two of you and not um, 
and not lose sight of it. And it's like, what is the significance of a marriage in the new relationship? Like she can be in a long-term thing, but just reserving a marriage for her dead spouse is I think a reasonable request. What's the, what's the, what's the difference there? Well, there's part of me that's thinking that asking someone not to get married is a little bit much um, just because it, it, it violates that person's autonomy to, to not to live right. And to be able to, to form relationships with other people and create long lasting relationships that they, they both feel they're committed in and equally a part of, which I know that exists outside of marriage alone, but some people feel that marriage really emphasizes that for them. Right. And it's, it serves as that next step in their relationship where they can be, you know, fully one as a couple. And again, that doesn't, that doesn't speak to all relationships. That doesn't marriage is thing that everyone needs to engage in. Right. It's very unique to each person. But if, let's say Zayna really felt that marriage was the step that was going to put her relationship in the place that it needed to be to thrive, then is it really fair for, for someone who doesn't understand the, the present scenario that she's in to be able to dictate what she does or doesn't do? I don't know. That's, I, I'm struggling with that. Yeah, I'm trying to put it into like terms that are more relevant to my life. So I'm thinking, like, what if you made a best friend pact with your best friend and then suddenly your best friend died in a terrible car crash. And they said before, or not a car crash, because you wouldn't hear their last words, but if they suddenly died and they were like, hey, I would prefer, like, you can have another best friend, but please don't make this very specific, very personal best friend pact that we made amongst ourselves before I died. Like, I think that is, it's easier for me to imagine. And I think that if you did that, if you made another best friend pact, then it would feel like a disrespectful action to that person who specifically asked you not to and meant a lot in your life. I like I know that's just marriage, but it's, you know, something that I'm not married, but I do have friends. So it's an easier way for me to wrap my head around it. Like, it'd be weird, right? If you had a best friend and they died and they said, don't do this. And then you did like it just. I don't know. I but feel... is marriage is marriage that specific though? What do you, you know? mean? For one, I maybe I misunderstood your example, right? But if you had a best friend pact that was <laughs> unique to you and that other person that the two of you engaged in, but you had never had that kind of pact with anybody else, it was unique to your friendship, and it's resting on inside jokes and things that you've accumulated over the years together. That's one thing, but to me, marriage is a ceremony that occurs for everyone, right? Everybody goes through the same ceremony to be married, right? I mean, at least, okay, I guess it would, could differ from culture to culture and everything, but the principle is the same, right? A lot, a lot of times there's no, what the concept of marriage is doesn't necessarily change drastically from person. Well, okay, wait, now I'm realizing <laughs> I can't make these generalizations, but my thing is, is like, it's, a best friend pact to me would rest on a very, very specific relationship. Whereas a person getting married with, let's say they were getting in married within the same, you know, geographic location and culture in which the marriage ceremony would stay relatively similar. Um, and the person that they were getting married to had the similar ideas about marriage as to their previous partner, right? Like it was a very similar idea, a similar custom or tradition, if you will, but it wasn't something that was, so built on a inside joke or something unique to that one person that you're like replacing them. Like, I don't think that that's what marriage would be. It would almost just be a continuation of another relationship with another person. I don't know if I would perceive it as a disrespect to the person that you were previously married to if they had, if they had died because the, the marriage wasn't, it wasn't like you were the first person to ever create marriage in the history of the planet. And this was a special thing that the, only the two of you had. And so it, it feels like it's less of a, a betrayal to that person you're not replacing them or trying to carry on a very specific custom yeah I think that I would represent more of that idea where I personally am coming at this from the perspective of one where marriage isn't as important or as valued as it would be for some people um, but I can totally understand why that symbol uh, or like reaffirmation of one's love and commitment to one another would be really important I am just personally coming from the perspective that it wouldn't be as important for me to get married sure. than it, to be in a long-term committed partnership with somebody Yeah. Uh, without having that aspect of marriage. 
um, so it's it's trying to see both sides of that argument. But I think that what is more interesting for me is if you guys' perspectives would change if uh, Yvonne or if Zaina at this point, because in the case she was in, in her 50s, 10 years past, she would now be in her 60s. If she was significantly younger, say in her 20s or 30s, and if that would impact like the perhaps the permissibility of getting married again or of having some other affirming symbol symbolic ceremony of some sort to affirm their relationship because it, it seems to me and not to sound too callous at all but but too callous you know but it seems to me that like the age is really important in this because i think some people might say that if you are like if you're in your 20s and you're you're married and your partner dies then they might be more open to the idea of having of of remarrying than if you're older than than that than what some people would might consider you know like the prime of your life or whatever yeah i agree like it does make me think about it differently like if you're if you're younger say you're like 25 and your spouse suddenly dies maybe you've been with them for three five years I don't know but the there's just so much there's so much of your life ahead of you at that point like you're so 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 young and there's so many things out there that you just haven't come across yet there's so many more people as opposed to if you've been in this committed relationship with a person for decades like I think that they become such a more integral part of your life and I feel like changing at that point and letting go and moving on would be so much more difficult and I think it's um I think it would be special and amazing if they were able to do so but I think that it does it does change things just the level of an just the level of how much that person is integrated into your life it would be difficult to reshuffle the decks at that point uh, this is hard for me as well. I don't know. I mean, there's there's that little voice in my head that kind of pops up in all of our ethics bold cases that's thinking, you know, who are we to to, to assign moral value to anybody's life choices? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I, I, I feel like that's such a, it's a really interesting perspective to consider. And I think it definitely creates this dynamic of, of how age impacts the morality of decisions as they, per, as they pertain to, to life-changing events. Um, because I think that is something unique to be explored. But I also, I, I want to be as careful as possible with like myself personally assigning a certain level of ethicality or morality to certain behaviors based on age, especially those related to long-term relationships and marriage, because I've never, you know, been, I've never been in that situation before. And I'm only 17, you know, I don't feel like I have the, the right, like I haven't spent enough time with people and, and experience, like life experience to understand the true depths of these, these issues to assign a certain level of morality to certain life choices dependent on age, you know? Yeah. Which I don't think hard. it's, I don't think it's unethical to get remarried at that point. I don't think that it is any kind of bad decision like it's your life and you get to do with it what you want and if getting remarried would bring you happiness and satisfaction then you do it I think that's a good idea but I just mm, so then I (laughs) so I don't know how we're supposed to think about this if it's not a bad decision like and we also can't interpret we we can't we can't interpret what that person would do if they were alive, because they're not, like, it's so subjective. I mean, she did say don't get remarried, so that gives us an idea of what her wishes were, but it's very hard to think about how to interpret this situation. Well, and it's kind of that individual liberty piece from earlier, right? Like, is, okay, and this is when it would come to being able to actually have a a conversation with Zaina, who unfortunately we cannot have a conversation with, Um, but the idea of whether her marriage in this situation would be a necessity for her to, to seek well-being in her life and to seek being the best person for herself and other people. To me, that's what it would come down to because I, you know, it seems at least from the, what we were provided with that Yvonne and Zaina had a, a healthy relationship with one another built on respect and love, you know, 
and I would argue that any kind of relationship in which that exists, there's kind of a mutual understanding of wanting to, to see the best in the other person, right? And having people have that ability and that space to, to become the best versions of themselves without harming other people and creating better communities around them, right? Just trying to, to fulfill their obligation as a moral citizen, right? It just comes down to that, right? If you're in a healthy relationship, I would argue that that would be a part of it. If the, the marriage would allow Zaina to pursue that in her regular life, is it really ethical to deny her of that fact? And it, is it fair to see, to interpret that maybe Yvonne would want that for her? I don't know, because I don't know enough about the relationship, but that's just a, a penny for, for your thoughts. Yeah, it's when you think about the stakeholders of this, it gets complicated because one of the stakeholders is someone who's dead. And according to, you know, there's no evidence that that person can still understand what's going on after their death. Like that person doesn't really get a say anymore because they're not an active participant in the world and they're not an active participant in this person's life. Like, they're they're just they're just they're not able to be hurt they're not able to do any of these things so why is that person able or why should that person be given consideration as to their feelings or what they would have wanted like if they're just not around anymore to do anything about it in regards to this case i would really love to hear more or hear the perspective of Zena's new partner because I think it's it's not really doing justice to uh, her new partner and their new relationship to not have uh, to have that person have a voice in this whole conversation. Simply saying that like Zena now wants to get or her partner is proposed and Zena would like to marry her new partner, but it doesn't give enough enough depth to whether this new partner is aware of Yvonne's wishes uh, in her will or is aware of this past relationship and the significance of marriage in her past relationship and whether that would be an obstacle that they would then have to overcome together as as a new partnership. And instead, it seems to me that this new idea of a new partner is a placeholder for the idea of simply going back uh, on a promise made to a deceased loved one about this symbolic moment in one's life and the symbolic relationship in one's life. So I think that I would personally need to know more and would love to hear the actual perspective of the new part of uh, Zayn's new partner in order to really do justice to all of the different stakeholders that are now really important in this discussion, because I don't feel like I am the one to make a judgment on their relationship without actually hearing from every single person involved. I'm just thinking about that new person as another important stakeholder, like in this position, like that person may never have been married before. Like this could be the, like the love of that person's life and to deny them that experience of marriage with the love of their life for the sake of someone who is dead is, is very hurtful theoretically to that person. Like, would the denial of this wish, like, or sorry, would following along with this wish cause more pain or more joy? In And I think that if it causes more pain, then it's a wish that should perhaps be rethought. And, and great. That and what Amalia said has gotten me thinking, too, about what, why would this be different if, the, if Yvonne and Zena were married or not? arguably isn't a long-term relationship carry the same weight regardless of whether one is married or not i mean because i know I that's know my perspective because i know we talked in class i mean again this is again like the statements expressed here may not always represent the statements of the, co- the opinions of the <laughs> college board but like yeah. the, the idea like, i don't know this is just i'm just throwing this out there and obviously i'm not trying to put pass a, a judgment on anything but i'm just thinking it's the idea of wouldn't a, a relationship, whether they got married or not, if they had that same level of commitment, regardless of whether they had that, they went through the ceremony or they went through that re- reaffirmation of what they knew or however you wanted to find marriage, if they were in the same headspace, why would it, why would it, what would be the difference, right? What I wonder what the, how the situation would change if Yvonne and Zena weren't married and perhaps were just in a long-term relationship, but they they were in the headspace, they, they were essentially married, right? Or they lived as a married couple. Would that change Yvonne's wishes? Would she tell Zayna never be in a relationship that's longstanding or that is 
that lives up to the same values as ours or has that commitment to one another that we had? How would this change if it was just about creating this longstanding relationship versus actually going through with the act of marriage? Just to throw in the hat for like the pragmatist, because marriage, like, because it's, it is personal, interpersonal, but it also serves a social function. Uh, to show individuals that the other people, like society, essentially, that two people are in a relationship and they're committed to one another. But it also has uh, legal purposes and like tax purposes. You get the legal ability to like speak for your partner. You have you get to make medical decisions on behalf of your partner. Like you get legal benefits from being considered someone's married partner. And so, from a symbolic standpoint, I really really understand and appreciate what you're saying Juliet but I'm also now thinking of the legal standpoint or of the financial standpoint where marriage does serve a purpose in trying to like uh have uh uh, it's it's hard to say because like it should be about like love and commitment and relationships but you do have to think about the finances and the legality of what marriage does for a couple and does for like the two families of a couple Right. And that makes it sound so cold to be discussing when we're talking about uh, Yvonne and Zaina and the new partner. And it it's, feels so heartless to try to bring that in. But it is something to consider. Well, and it's interesting, too, because I, I, I agree with you. That is really important to consider. But what about the fact that it seems as though Yvonne is is more interested in not prohibiting, but challenging the symbolic part of the relationship Right. And what that means, as opposed to the tax and legality part of that relationship. Yeah, Uh, I was going to say, like, what is the difference between a long term commitment and marriage in this case? Because she's not saying don't have the same kind of emotional intimacy that we had with another person ever again. She just says don't get married. I don't know what the significant like what the meaningful difference is for her in that case. It doesn't seem to be don't have what we had. It's just marriage part. Like, that's it. It's it's really hard to interpret that when it's so, like, up to the individual to decide what that means. Well, then I think that unless anybody has anything to add about that conversation, I think the third question in this case is really interesting to talk about, too. The idea of what if any are the morally significant differences between a promise made to someone who is now dead and a promise made to someone who is still alive. Yeah, it's not like they got, I mean, it would be very, very different situation if, say, they got divorced and decided to stop being with each other. Like, that's not at all the same thing, because in this case of a death, without that death, they would have had the intention of spending the rest of their lives together. Like, they would have theoretically been together for many more decades. And the, there was an expectation of a continued relationship. So it's it's just weird to leave something off at a point where where no one wanted it to end that way. If they had divorced, this wouldn't have been a question at all. Like she would have been gone from her life. It, it wouldn't have the same kind of repercussions with it. It made me think of something else it's it's the old-fashioned like get your blessing from your father about whether or not you can get married you know it's like that's another sort of situation of a person who's able to dictate over your life what they want to happen with it and what you're allowed to do but that one we are taking I mean some people take it less seriously just because like not just because they're alive but that that, I don't know that's just another example I was thinking of yeah but I don't know if that's (sighs) I struggle with that one too because I think that that's more it's just a a way to respect the the fact that the parents typically like in that situation if a parent had raised the, the the child and and really wanted to to give the their um acknowledgement of their respect and approval of the spouse I don't know I mean I I could see that it being problematic if someone was trying to stop a relationship or you know harm or coerce someone but I don't know if it always has to be that way. Yeah. Maybe it's like, well, when you're dead, it doesn't affect you anymore. Like not as much as it would affect someone who is still alive. Like disobeying someone who's still alive wishes has more of like a tangible consequence. 
And it's also the opportunity for an ongoing dialogue if circumstances change or if uh, something happens that made it made you unable to fulfill a promise. If someone is still alive, you have the chance to uh, continue con- conversing or talking with this person to try to maybe adjust the, um, the promise itself. But if you made a promise to someone who, who has died, then you don't have that opportunity for ongoing dialogue, even if the circumstances have changed dramatically and you no longer feel like you can complete that promise in good faith. It has good intentions behind it, but in terms of limiting the other person's freedom, you don't, like, if you're not able to talk back, it, it's, it's not the best situation. But again, I return, I just, I keep returning to the idea of what it means to be in a relationship where, where people would be respectful of one another enough to leave um, appropriate promises. You know, I, I just, I, I can't, I mean, maybe with money or something, if something had shifted around and someone was in need of help and they needed you to, there was money in the will that they really needed access to or something had happened with a family member, I, I maybe that, that that's where interpretation would change or if there was if there was a piece of art or something that somebody owned and they wanted to maintain, maintain control of it, but uh, news came out that it belonged to another group of people and the situation had changed. They wanted to give that art back, you know, something like that. I could see like with material goods, how things could change with the time, but I struggle to think of any requests that someone would have for another person that, well, like if they were truly in a respectful relationship where both people wanted to honor one another, that would ultimately cause a great deal of harm to the person who the request was being made to. Like in this case, the please don't drink caffeine. You could tell that Yvonne and Zena were in a respectful relationship. They wanted to honor each other and, and create the best versions of themselves. Um, and the caffeine doesn't really limit anybody's ability to do so. It's, it's a reasonable ask. It's built on a foundation of respect and care. So I feel like that, that ought to be honored. But if you're really being asked to do something that is going to violate your rights to the extent at which it's not going to allow you to provide for yourself or others or to carry out your life in a, a meaning or fulfilling way, then is, is that really a respect? Is that a, res, a request that you have to honor, right? Was that part of a respectful relationship where the two of you were on an equal playing field and, and made decisions out of care? And, and did you do promises carry as much weight in a relationship like that where you, you, you weren't equally considered or respected? <sighs> I don't know. I, well, I don't know if, if a request has to violate someone's liberty to be considered unreasonable. Not drinking caffeine, like, it's it's kind of an insignificant, I mean, it's kind of an insignificant thing. Why can't I do that other than you say, don't do it? Like, that's, that, I don't think that's a good reason to do things. Just because someone else said, don't, I say, because I say so. If she was still alive and she hadn't died, like, would she be able to say, don't drink caffeine anyways? Like, that, I don't know. It's, it's a very one-sided request, and it's, it's, I know that it's not intended to be manipulative, but I think it has that effect on that person's life, where they're saying, well, why can't I? But I think there is a good reason here. I don't know, Gray, what do you think? I've, I've spoken a lot. Um, I think, Juliet, what you were saying about care and respect and having it be like an equal partnership, if wishes are to be respected, is really important. And from the limited information that we do have, it does seem like Zena and Yvonne did have that kind of relationship, very, very much based on mutual respect uh, and love and a deep care for one another. Um, but I think that it's like in trying to generalize, it just breaks down because every single situation is going to be so different that we can't make a universal rule for whether we ought to respect wishes, however insignificant or however uh, maybe ridiculous they seem, because every single circumstance is going to be very different. And we can't know all of the history that has gone into making these requests. It's very complicated. Well, let's think about like, um, I know when you were talking about this earlier, we thought about what about people who have died who aren't particularly close to us, like people, like distant relatives who say, I want you to always wear this necklace that I had. 
like if that was someone's dying wish like that's not necessarily something you have to respect so do you think it's just like the proximity of the relationship to someone that makes it more important not necessarily their being dead i don't know but why why not respect that wish because you don't want to yeah but but okay but realistically if the person who told you that they wanted you to wear that necklace right they obviously put thought into that decision it was probably an important heirloom to them and and, and for them to think of you in such a manner i feel like it's you gotta you gotta respect that to some extent i mean they they were joyful that brought them joy <laughs> knowing that you would have that you know and maybe you don't wear it all the time but when you have a special occasion you wear it you know i don't see i feel like there's room for compromise here like that to me that doesn't violate someone's liberty to the extent where it's unreasonable right like just be in it it would well I, okay i don't know but I, I think that the idea of not wanting to do something just because you don't want to do it doesn't give you an out to, to not respect the wishes of those who came before you. If yeah. it was something like you were, you were never allowed to buy a car. Okay. That may really impact someone who let's say lives an hour away from their work and they don't have access to public transportation. They may need to buy a car one day and that's violating their liberty and their right to go and exercise their job and provide for their family on a regular basis. So, what ends up happening is, is that's a, a respect or a wish that you may ultimately have to break because you have a reason that that's not allowing you to, to live your life to the extent that you need to. It's not allowing you to. Yeah, but what authority does that person have over your life to dictate that? Like, where does that right to do something come from? Like, they don't have a valid reason for that, or at least not a reason that's meaningful or valid to you. And you don't know them and you don't really care about them. So why should Whoa. you have to do that? <laughs> I'm saying, I mean, if it's your grandma that you met three times in your life, like, why does she get to say that? And why should you follow through with it just because they're dead? Like, I mean, okay, so in that hypothetical scenario, I would argue that it would be important for the person who received that heirloom to do research on what it meant to the person and, and to understand the depth of what that gift symbolizes. And if they felt uncomfortable wearing it, that's their choice, I guess, but they should at least keep it, keep it safe and understand the value it has. Right. I think that's the least that you can do. Um, and I, I would go as, I would say, you know, if you really feel uncomfortable, if it's causing you discomfort, right. Which is a very mild form of suffering, I guess some, <laughs> some, some people in ethics might claim, then, then that's a problem. And, but you should still try to keep it safe. I, but I think that if you can, you ought to compromise and wear it when it, on special occasions, perhaps when you see your family, as a reminder of the memory of that person. I just think that because the people who came before us make us who we are, we ought to do what we can to respect them. I think that there's a difference between completely breaking the promise, even if it's to someone that you didn't know very well, like an extended family member, and they're asking you to do something like wearing a necklace. There's a difference between breaking the promise or like trying to respect that promise while still living your own life. Like I personally, if I were in that situation, I would keep the necklace. I would put it in in a very special location uh, to honor the memory of my deceased relative. But I would I don't feel comfortable wearing necklaces in my day to day life. It doesn't it makes me feel incredibly uncomfortable. And so I don't think that I personally would and, and Julie, you're saying un- discomfort versus respecting the wishes of the dead. I think that it is respect. It is it is respecting my deceased relative by trying to honor her, uh, honor them in a way that would be that that would feel meaningful to me in trying sure. to remember their memory and also trying to keep safe what they what they gave to me in their will. Right, like keep it safe, respect it, value it. And try to remember them in a way that I feel is is meaningful, because then it feels like there's more of a personal connection in my perspective than wearing the necklace and then maybe not remembering them as often or then linking wearing the necklace with feelings of discomfort uh, that then wouldn't be very respectful to that dead family member. I think that there is definitely a limit to things that dead people can say to do that people actually have to follow through on like 
if some dead person says on their deathbed, I want someone named John to come by my grave every Saturday and give me a bouquet of eight white lilies. Like, does that really need to be respected? Like, that's uh, a tax on people's time and resources. And it's just any arbitrary random person named John. Like, that's not necessarily something people should have to follow through on. And I don't think that a request made by someone just because they're dying or dead has to be considered valid. But I don't think that's why we consider it valid or respected. Because you say like it it puts a tax on other people and requires them to use their time. Well, in the case of a family member, they've spent their entire, if they're close to you, they've spent their, their lives dedicating their time to you. You know, especially, or even like with this case, right, Yvonne spent her life, like her, or at least her married life with Zayna. Like that was her time. That was her tax. Like she put effort towards that. And that's why Zayna has the obligation to respect her after she's died. And yes, some may say like that's reciprocal relationships or whatever, but I don't see it that way. I would see it more as just a, an act of gratitude. Right. And I I agree with Gray. If it causes you discomfort, try to find a way that feels appropriate to you and yourself to to honor that person and find gratitude for them. Just like keep them in your thoughts, because I think that we owe we do so much for each other that I feel like it is important to know that we all have each other's back, even when we're no longer here and that we can we can watch out for one another and respect what we've done. I think that we ought to respect uh, the wishes of the dead to the extent that we can honor their memory and honor the spirit of, of what they wished for us uh, while recognizing that circumstances can change and that the world doesn't, doesn't stay the same once someone passes on. That was this week's edition of The Gray Zone. Thank you so much for listening. If you have any comments or questions that you would like to add, we have an email account, the Gray Zone Podcasts, that's podcasts plural, at gmail.com. We'll be sure to include that in the description below. If you leave us a comment or a question, we will do our best to address it in a future episode. These cases are from the National High School Ethics Bowl case set, which can be found online. We encourage you to engage in this type of dialogue in your daily life and see if you can find an Ethics Bowl program near you to get involved with. Thanks again for listening.